Good morning, church family. I can't think of a better way to start our day today than to stand, if you're able, and sing of the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. He's our firm foundation. So let's sing this together. Rejoice in Him. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So I would. times where it has been very difficult and times where it has been mediocre and times that it's been joyful and celebratory. But Jesus has been that thread through our whole lives. And so if you don't see that, would you just maybe even step forward and trust that that's true in this moment? Do you trust that Jesus Christ, your creator, has been faithful, has been present, and he is worthy to be trusted. When others let us down, Jesus can be trusted. So let's sing this together, church. Place our faith and hope in him. i 
test of time and so we long for that day when all of those generations thousands of generations come and worship him and proclaim Jesus Christ you're holy forever you have proven yourself and so right now this generation right here I think I see the younger students here I see um, the middle aged here and the ones that are empty nesters around this room every generation worshiping Jesus so let's start right here let's worship him Tell him that he's holy forever. So let's sing this together as an entire church body. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us, and all the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry.
can be seated. How beautiful it is to hear you all sing. Um, we're going to continue to worship through giving, and so I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward and pass the offering place. This is one way that you can uh, continue to give. We give our offering of praise to Jesus, but we also give um, uh, of our resources and our time and our talents, and so um, there's um, this way to give, but there's also, there's boxes at the back of each exit that you can give as well, and then also you can go online and go to hhbc.com forward slash give as well. So um, I'm gonna invite Phil to come up and pray for us. If the ushers could hold on for just a second, let's just pray that uh, we can give this offering in a manner that is uh, worthy. And also, Lord, uh, that the Lord will take our gifts and, and, and turn them into, uh, into something that only he can do. Father, uh, we're reminded in Revelation 21 that one day we will all stand before the throne. And there'll be no need for light or for moon or for anything because the lamb and the light, uh, the lamb and the lamp are the light. And there'll be no temple because the lamb is the temple. And so, Lord, we, we do gather to recognize your holiness. We pray, Father, that it would be transformative and that we would be forever unchanged. These gifts, Father, are just a token, just a sign and a signal that all that we have is yours. And we thank you for entrusting it to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's here. 
fall time crunch is here. And uh, I remember driving to, to church this week and I pull up to a school and there's a, a big long line of cars. I didn't even have to be in line. I'm like, what's going on? And then I got to thinking, well, these poor parents are sitting there every morning. And so it, it, we have to decide as the people of God, what are we going to do to be intentional about making time for things that matter. As a matter of fact, this afternoon, just at 200 of our community group leaders are gonna be gathering together for encouragement and for appreciation for training because we know that having thriving, growing, powerful community groups, that matters. And so uh, this Wednesday at 6.15, we'll start our equipping classes. Uh, our vision is to equip one another to love Jesus and to live sin. And so it's a big part of who we are, what we do. We'll be looking at Christology for those who want to deep dive into the character and nature of Jesus. We'll also be having a spiritual disciplines class for new Christians or for young Christians who are still developing their, their, uh, their rhythm for, for following Jesus. And so we have a men's Bible study and a women's Bible study, lots of opportunities for you to start this Wednesday. And we gather together because things matter. Amen? Kind of weak and puny. I'll give you another shot at it in a minute. <clears throat> and then uh, Wednesday, I mean Thursday night. This, by the way, in 42 years of ministry, is the first time I've ever prayed with a uh, lawn chair in my hand. And so uh, this is about Thursday night. We have a men's ministry tailgate, and uh, we have 15 different community groups offering to make food in a, an, an entry as a as contestant for tailgate food. And uh, then after we've had food together, then we'll meet right there in the green and we'll be listening to Lou Sterrett, who's going to tame and ride a horse that's never been ridden. And he's going to use that as an example of how the gospel, how our hearts are distant and, and alone and rebellious before God. But we can't live that way until eventually when we submit to him and then he takes control. Then we found Jesus the way we need to. And so so uh, if you're going to do that, if you're going to eat, and if you're going to listen to Lou Sterrett, you're going to need to bring a lawn chair. Can I get an amen? amen? I knew you could do it. All right, let's get back to worship. on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Well, good morning, church family. It's always good to be together in a spirit of worship like this. If you're new with us, my name is John. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, it's always an honor to get to open God's word with you. If I haven't met you yet, please come say hello to me. I'd love to meet you uh, at some point. We're just getting into a sermon series through the Apostle Paul's letter to the Colossian Christians in the New Testament. Uh, we're just starting it off, and, and it's reminding us of this truth, as you've seen all over the logos, Christ is above all. That's the main point of that book. And so the many false beliefs in that religious melting pot of Colossae were assaulting that young church. And so Paul felt it was important to write a letter to them to say, here's the gospel, defending the gospel message. But if you remember last week, we saw that our context today is not actually that much different than it was 2,000 years ago in Colossae. And so this, this letter speaks to us just as much, and we can be challenged by it in the same ways. So go ahead and take your copy of God's Word. Turn with me to Colossians. 
Uh, towards the end of the Bible, after a couple long books, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, a couple others, then get to Colossians. Put that bookmark there that you can get out at the lobby. Uh, there's a couple things else you could get there just to remind ourselves that Christ is above all, uh, but we'll be there for the next few months. Before we get there, though, uh, one of my favorite days of the year is Thanksgiving. Anybody else love Thanksgiving? One of your favorite days? Yeah. Uh, always with family, and there's always football on all day. Uh, always eat too much pumpkin pie. Uh, well, I should rephrase that. Whipped cream with a little bit of pumpkin pie, if you know what I mean by that. Uh, but it's, it's so funny. One of the funny moments of that day every year is, is the mixed reactions around the table whenever we, we sit down and we're about ready to eat, and then someone speaks up and says, how about we all say what we're thankful for? You know what I'm talking about, right? Anybody that happened to your family too? Now, I'm not criticizing that. You can keep doing it if that's your deal. Uh, but, but it's funny to me the reactions that come with that. You get some groans from this guy over here. You get some chuckles over here. You get wide eyes. People don't want to say anything. Uh, you get somebody who's just all into it and the gravy's getting cold. I mean, you, you, so, some people treat it like a joke, right? You kind of go through there and say, well, I'm thankful for family, you know, just because you have to. Uh, but but think, think about that moment. Is that true gratitude? I mean, I, I think in some cases, yes, it is. But, but if we have to force Thanksgiving is it really Thanksgiving at all? Well, what we're going to see today actually is what true Thanksgiving is about. We're going to see where it comes from. We're going to see what it leads to. We're going to see what true Thanksgiving is all about. So we're just a few verses into Colossians here. Verses 3 through 8 is where we're going to be today of chapter 1. His letter continues, saying, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you've heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is, bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. God, open our eyes to see what you want us to see today. Open our hearts, our lives, that we would be good soil, that we would not be merely hearers of the word, but we'd be doers of it in the power of the Spirit as we submit to you, Jesus, as the king over all things. God, show us, though, where you want each of us and us together to be different for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so again, this section was typical of Paul. When he'd write a letter, uh, after he'd introduce himself, he would typically include this Thanksgiving section, extended part of that. But it was actually more than just Thanksgiving Every letter, almost all of them, in the New Testament we have from Paul, the thanksgiving section here of the letter is the theological basis for the rest of the letter. That it provides the basis, and it's what God has done, so the rest of it then makes sense. And so Paul's thanksgiving was not merely to puff them up, like, hey, Colossians, here's how great you are, here's how awesome you've done this. It's actually reminding them, again, of the glory of Christ and the power and glory of his salvation in their lives. Well, in reality, that should be the source of our thanksgiving as well. God himself. It, it, that's the source of Paul's thanksgiving here is God himself. God is the source. We're going to see a lot more about this next week in verse 9 and beyond where he's actually praying things for them. But, but really, we can't miss this. Like verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. So we're, he's praying and thanking God for them. But, but notice the theological statement he's making here. 
He's not just praying to some generic God. Again, all the Colossians around them, the people had all kinds of gods. He's not praying to just a God out there. He's praying to not even merely the Jewish God that he'd been worshiping his whole life till a couple of years ago. He's worshiping God Almighty. This is the God now who's known as the father of who, who Paul thought was an imposter before, Jesus. So his whole theological framework has changed because he now knows who Jesus is. But notice he's not just worshiping a generic Jesus either. (laughs) He's worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, like the, the perfect term for clarifying Jesus as God. Because listen, that's that's who Paul and the church saw Jesus to be back then. He's God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. Again, counter to all the gods around them in Colossae, this is who our God is. But that, remember, that was the source of thanksgiving for Paul. It was that all good things in our lives comes from this God Almighty, the Lord of heaven and earth, sovereign, good, holy, that we just sang about. This is who it comes from. All our good things. All good things. Now, now everything, so remember, this is his theological foundation. So everything he's about to say about the Colossians, everything he's about to say to the Colossians, all the reminders and everything he's about to say, it comes from God. We thank God. It's a good reminder for us today, isn't it? Amen. Like when we think about all that we have in our lives, whether you think you have a lot or a little, we, we should not divorce God's blessings in our life from the source of the blessings in our life. I mean, we're really tempted in our culture to focus on all the things that we have and we don't have enough of this or we need more of these things or we're comparing between other people. How about we just stop and say, thank you, God, for all that you have given us. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights. Like when you're sitting around that Thanksgiving table, of course you're not going to be excited to share what you're thankful for if you don't see all the good things in your life as from the Lord. You're going to be disappointed, be discouraged. No, you should say, I want to know God and and he's given me the blessing of knowing him and having all the things I have. Let's be thankful first and foremost. So the source of thanksgiving is God. But then Paul continues by showing the Colossians that the foundation of thanksgiving now, the basis from that is hope. So God's the source, but what does he give then that we can base our thanksgiving on? Well, it's hope. Look at verses four and five again. Since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now, the construction in the original language, the way it was written back then in the Greek, it's it's different than English. And so it reads a little funny to us whenever we try to put it in the same order. So it looks like it's out of order. But notice the first word of verse 4 is the word since, S-I-N-C-E. That word ties what he's about to say to what he just said. And so the reason, notice what he says, the reason he thanks God in his prayers is because of the faith and the love that he sees in the Colossians. See that? He's like, I thank God since I see these things, but then in verse five, he says, the reason you have those things is because of the hope you have in God. Right, So it goes kind of backwards. you got to work backwards a little bit from that. But the hope laid up for them in heaven is the reason they have faith and love, which is the reason he's giving thanks for them. Okay? See that? Now, this word for hope here, this is the basis, right? The foundation, the, the, the hope word can mean the state or activity of hoping, like you're expectant for something. And we say it all the time in our culture, don't we? <laughs> like, man, I, I hope the Cowboys win. And probably won't. But you know what I mean. Like, I, I hope they win. And, and it's kind of this expectation that, man, it might happen. 
But this is different. This word here, hope, is actually talking about the actual thing hoped for. The substance of the hope, not just the expectancy of something in the future. That's the difference here. Here, he says, it's something laid up for them in heaven. It's something stored for them in heaven. Like you might even see the squirrels in your backyard right now, where they're digging holes and burying acorns, and then later in the winter, it's not like the squirrels up in the tree just thinking like, man, I hope there's an acorn down there somewhere. You know, he, he's hoping in the actual acorn itself, right? That's the difference he's talking about in the same way here. There's an expectancy, yes, but it's more about the tangible item itself as the hope. What is it here? The hope stored up for them in heaven is an actual, tangible eternity with Jesus. That is the hope that they're talking about here, that is in the Colossians' heart, that Paul is commending in them. And 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says it really well, tying eternity to that hope, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Two, now notice that's good enough, right? We sing a lot about that. We talk a lot about that. The, the gospel hope, right? Resurrection. But verse four, also to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So you see it here. There's something held out there, and it's not just, man, I hope something happens. It's an actual thing out there that God says is yours, and it's kept, stored, like a bank vault kept there where you will eventually get it. And so you think about the Colossian church was getting squeezed by all of these other religions pressing on them, and many of those never even mentioned an afterlife at all. There was no hope beyond the grave. It was just making your life better now. So this hope of an eternal life, of something better to come, would be a powerful witness in Colossae. As 1 Peter 3.15 says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, Christ above all, meaning that, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. I mean, hope is a powerful witness. When you face death, and somebody hears that you're facing this situation or you've lost loved ones or whatever. First Thessalonians talks about grieving with hope. There's something different when you have an expectancy and an assurance that there is something out there and it's good. It's God's promise. It's his, his eternity with him. Like that's coming. It sure changes the way that we walk today, right? Like if there's joy when you face those moments, it's a powerful witness that only comes from hope in something beyond. Hope in Jesus beyond. So it's a witness, but it's also, eternal hope is also a powerful motivator for us today. That's how this word ties back to the statements in verse four. I'm gonna read them again. He says, I pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So you see, again, the construction of this here. The hope is what is driving this motivating of faith and love today. Constant faith, that you're steady, you're constant in your trust, but then also sacrificial, costly love today comes from the hope. You can be steady. You can sacrifice because of the hope you have in Christ. So it's a motivator towards those things. That's what he talks about here. The results of hope, well, hope leads to, first, faith. And dig deeper into those little two words there, faith. Eternal hope in Christ leads to faith in Christ. 
Now, I'm sure like me, you've heard in the news or read in the newspaper or something that, that the word faith is thrown around so flippantly, meaning any religious belief out there. Right? People of all faiths, you've heard that said before. And to an extent, I get that where they believe what they believe just like we do in some sense, but, but notice there's a difference here in Colossians 1 that Paul makes it explicit. He says, faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ Jesus. And that word faith means not merely personal trust and commitment. We kind of go extremes on this. It, it doesn't just mean I'm committed, I believe, I trust him, I'm gonna follow him, It also means affirming a set of truths about that Jesus, right? So it's both and. We often swing one way or the other. It's both of those things. It's an exclusive claim of truth that Jesus is who he is and has done what he's done, and he's the only way to be good with God. But but think about how countercultural that would have been in Colossae, Right? All these other religions floating around saying, here's a way to God, here's a way to God, here's a way to God, here's a way to be right with God, here's a way to figure out all of those things. And so Paul saying to them and reminding them, hey, Jesus is actually the only way. Remember that. Faith in Jesus Christ, the only way to be good with God. How countercultural that would have been in Colossae, right? How countercultural is that today in our culture? Like when you start to think about the fact that Jesus is the only way to, with, to be with God, that there is an exclusive claim of truth in our belief system, that nobody else is right. <laughs> that is completely countercultural. That will get you kicked out of schools, right? That, that will get you in a big heap of trouble. But that's part of the nature of our faith. If Christ is above all, if he has lived, died, and resurrected, and he has ascended, and he's the king over all things, then he has a right to say exclusive truth. And so the nature of our faith does involve affirming a set of beliefs about Jesus that includes that he is the only way. Faith in Christ Jesus. It does include committing to him, but you have to believe who he is before you can commit to him. And they go together. But listen, I know, I'm I'm right there with you. As hard as our sinful nature kicks against that submission to God, to exclusivity, as much as we don't like that, Paul ties it to making it a little bit easier. When you think about the hope laid up for us in heaven, as he says here. The hope that believers have. In other words, what he's saying, you can, you can, as a believer, you can say, God, you've given me everything I would ever need. Okay, I'm all yours. That's essentially what he's saying, is that you can have, because of that hope you have, that you have everything eternally in him, you can now say today, okay, Jesus, I'm yours. I am All in, no question. Even though I can't see it, Romans 8 talks about this, even though I can't see that hope, I wait for it with patience because I know it's there and I live differently with patience, committing to him whatever comes because he's good and he's provided all that I need. So that's hope-fueled faith. But he also says here that there's something produced by that faith. It's not just I get to have a belief system now. In verse 4, that hope led to faith, but it also produced a sacrificial love. He says, hey, Colossians, I've heard of your faith and your love. Notice, Notice he says your love not just for those who are like you, your love for all the saints, for all the brothers and sisters. Verse 8 even calls it a spirit-filled love. And if the spirit is involved, you know the spirit's active, the spirit is moving, that means it's not just a feeling, it's active, sacrificial love for the brothers and sisters around you. And maybe not even around you, maybe just 
those plus to the ends of the earth. But listen, if anything in our lives, this kind of Jesus-y, agape love, that is what distinguishes Christians most from the rest of the world. To truly sacrifice for other people's goods, even when they don't deserve it, even when they can never pay you back, that is true love. I mean, there's stories all over the New Testament, all over God's word of this happening. One example is the impoverished Thessalonians. They gave all, almost all of their money to support the Macedonians who were suffering under famine and hardship. They didn't have anything to begin with, and yet they're giving all that away because they love their brothers and sisters, many of whom, most of whom, they probably never met before. But this... Again, this, 1 John, the whole book, especially chapters 3 and 4, this is the evidence that you have been made alive spiritually. If you love the brothers and sisters, if you truly not just like them, but you love them deeply, core who you are, you love, sacrifice, you give, you, you work for their good, you prioritize and focus on them, that is a marker that you have been made new. Why? Because that's the way Jesus loved you. That's what he did for you. And now all we can do is say, well, I need to love others just like he loved me. But how does that relate to this hope that laid up for us in heaven in verse five? Well, again, 1 Peter has a great way to say it. 1 Peter 1, 20 through 23 says that Jesus was foreknown but made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And so you've been redeemed, you've been saved, but then look at 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God, right? So there's there's a reality he says in 1 Peter that because you are made new, you love your brothers, you love your sisters. It's part of the deal. You've been purified, you've been made different, so love like Jesus loves because of the hope you have The faith and hope you have, now you love others. Eternal hope leads to faith and loving others. Here's what that means. You can be steady when you're blasted at work. That means when you get that cancer diagnosis, you can stay steady. That means when you you can love others in really costly ways, even when people don't understand it, you can still love that way. These are the ways that the hope leads to faith and love. In fact, Paul summarizes that whole word of hope with one word at the end of verse five. He says, gospel. The word gospel. Here's the word of hope. It's the gospel, the one they'd heard, the good news, the word of hope, the word of truth. For Paul, this was hugely important because it contained truth that changed lives. But notice He's talking about it in such a way that it's not merely an invitation you tack on at the end of the sermon. It's not merely a technique to change people's lives. It is a power let loose in the world because of who it's about. We'll see he personifies it a little bit later. Like there's something about it as it's let loose because of who it's about. Again, he's talking in a context with all these false religions around. He keeps going back to the gospel truth that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the basic of it. He says, I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved. Right? So he's saying, you heard it, you believed it, you're standing in it now, and you're going to stand in it forever. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's it. 
That's, that's what he keeps going back to. No other religious system has a God who took on flesh, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death to pay for your sins, defeated death by coming out of the grave alive. That's what guarantees the hope stored up for us in heaven. The fact that Jesus is alive. I mean, there's a lot of religious leaders who've died. Only one's come back and is still alive and is holding and guaranteeing that inheritance we get. So that's what guarantees our hope that we serve a risen savior, that he is one that we can worship and know even today, not just someday. That's why we always sing the gospel, pray the gospel, preach the gospel, call people to believe the gospel and respond to the gospel here. It's because this is pointing us to this word of hope, the one that that did it all for us, that he is reminding us of that truth through the gospel. He's proven it and it's hope for us. It should should give us a stirring of hope every time we hear, sing, read, pray, all of that. Paul wrote it in Romans 1.15 that even Christians need the gospel regularly. So we can't think it's just like the the ticket when you go to the the game or the concert and you give your ticket to the, no, they still do that. You gotta pull your phone out and scroll and you gotta find it. You're like, "That's, that's your entry point into the event The gospel is not just the entry point in and you go on to other things. No, this is actually because it's about Jesus and what he's done for us. That's where we just immerse into and swim in that deeper and deeper forever. It's good news. It's why we just beat it over and over and over again here at the church. The drumbeat of the gospel pointing us to Christ above all. That's the point. Because what we believe is that leads us to hope, to faith, to love. Here's what's beautiful about this passage, though. It doesn't stop there. I mean, it could. It's great. But what he continues to spill out of his mouth are words regarding the power of that gospel. Like, what does it actually do in people's lives, including he almost personifies it in verse 6. The gospel has come to you. Now, does that mean the gospel, like, sprouted legs and ran to Colossae and it came to you? No, no. It was through a messenger, right? Right? It was through Epaphras, who was a local boy that Paul sent there to preach the gospel. And he's a faithful minister, it says. He loved his people. They loved Epaphras, which, by the way, is an example we can all follow. <laughs> like even when we talk about living sin, even if you never leave Edmund, you can be a minister of the gospel in your hometown, loving people and being loved for the sake of the glory of God wherever you live. Let that be an encouragement to you. You don't have to leave, but you better be active as we see Epaphras was. But here, he personifies it, okay, just as quickly as he did that, he actually shifts to make it a plant. (laughs) And we know the gospel's not a plant, but look at the image, verse six. The gospel has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So Paul reminded them the gospel is at work among them. It's bearing fruit. It's increasing in their own lives. That's what the gospel does. We see it all over. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit coming out of you more. You see John 15, Jesus says, I appointed you to bear fruit. The the parable in Mark 4 of the, the soils, the gospel that landed in the good soil produced fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. The gospel takes root in someone's life. What happens? It bears fruit. What this means is the Colossian Christians, when Paul was talking to them, should take heart in the fact it really was working in their life. Maybe they couldn't see it very well. Like maybe they were discouraged by all these other religious systems. It was drowned out. But the gospel, Paul, an objective outsider said, no, I see it. It's working. Maybe, here's here's the thing. Maybe they were confused by all the religious experiences they were seeing around them that theirs didn't look like those people over there. And that that was a little crazier, a little wild over there. I don't see that in my life. And and they're looking different. And, And these people over here are having a experiences that are different than mine. Maybe they were confused by that. Well, Paul just says, okay, listen, no. Here's what God has done in your life. Here's what God has done. Because experience can mislead you. 
multiple ways. Either you can say, here's the experience I had, and that can actually deceive you because it can be a misled experience. Or you can say, because I haven't had that kind of an experience, then I don't have what they have. And that's where I have been most of my life because I grew up a church kid. Middle schoolers, I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you, right? Like this is where we all, we grow up in the church and we kind of live this, this experience of it's all I know. And I don't see this massive transformation like that guy's story or her story. And, and I, I don't see it, so I kind of feel like maybe I don't actually know Jesus. Listen, Paul looks at them and says, no, God is making you more like Jesus. You might not see it day to day, but you can look back over months and years and you can say, yeah, okay. I can see God at work in my life. He can look at the church and say, hey, God's making you more like a family. Look at this. Don't you see it? We get immersed into it. We don't see it all the time. And so listen, I know you might feel like you don't have the same conversion experience as somebody else does. Your journey to Christ is different, but the question is, has God worked in your life? Like, can you attribute change in your life to God doing something, to only God working, to only, not, not just changing your circumstances and changing your situation, but did God do something in your life? Like, I just met with a man this week who lived his whole life, kind of this, this religious person. He was at church, he was involved, he was even serving, these kind of things, but God had to break him of some deep, deep things. But when God broke those things, he finally stepped into freedom. He'd been hiding for so long, God broke him and he stepped into the freedom and now it was so encouraging to me because he is living this life that is completely sold out to Jesus because he's not trying to hold on to some religious experience anymore. He's just saying, Jesus broke me. Jesus changed me. Jesus saved me. I'm his. And so he's going to work in your life. It's the call every week. Open your heart. Open your life to let him do something. But also as a church, he's talking to the church in Colossae. Are we today becoming more gentle? Are we becoming more servant-minded? Are we becoming kinder? Are we becoming more generous? God's gospel works in us together just as much. But it wasn't just working in Colossae, right? This growing plant was not just contained. He says it's actually going all over. It's spreading. And how is it spreading in their hearts? How is it spreading to the ends of the earth? Because it was empowered. The gospel spread is empowered by God. It's empowered. Because remember, it's God who causes the growth of the gospel in us. And it's God who calls to go. It's God who sends. It's God who plants. It's God's work in us and through us. He uses us, absolutely, but it's, it's not about us in the end. It's God's work. We should want to plant and water the seed all around us because of what he's done in us, the hope we have, but it's about God's work. This is interesting. Some people believe the phrase, verse 6, that says, bearing fruit and increasing is actually a callback to Genesis 1 and 2, where God created everything, the narrative of that. Because when you think about it, Back in Genesis 1 and 2, it was God, his word, that was creating, and God was commanding, and he said to Adam, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. With whom? With worshipers, basically. With, with image bearers like you, reflecting my glory. That's what it was in Genesis 1 and 2. What's happening here? Colossians 1. It's the word of truth that recreates and commands. And through the new Adam, Christ, he's still called to do what? To multiply and fill the earth with whom? With worshipers. And so, so you see what's happening here. Like this, this calling from the very beginning to say, fill the earth with, with my redeemed humanity. Now it's still the same thing. Fill the earth with my redeemed humanity. 
We even see it in Acts 12. The word of God increased and multiplied. It's the same language from back then. This is what God is doing As you and I hear the word of truth, we are changed, we are made different, we're filled with hope, filled with love, filled with faith, then God's plan is fulfilled. As we go live sent out there, we carry that hope, we see the plan fulfilled. It's what God intended from the very beginning because here's here's what the result is. The result of what was supposed to be through Adam, they failed, But now the result through Christ and by extension through us is this recreated global eternal kingdom society that lives and thinks and loves like Jesus does. That's the kingdom of God that he is producing through recreated humanity. As we are fruitful and multiply, as this word spreads in an empowered way, listen, that's why we're here. Because remember, kids, God doesn't just poof you up to heaven as soon as you believe, right? He leaves you here. Why does he leave you here? For this. Why do we gather like this? To be reminded, this is what it's about. Why do we go? To take this hope to those around us. That's why we love one another. To model this recreated humanity. To model the kingdom. That's why we are here. It's all for God's glory that he shows off through a new creature called the church. But listen, don't walk away from this feeling pressure, feeling like, oh man, we got more to do now. That should be a grateful response. When we look at all these things, it should be with praise and thanksgiving on our lips. Why? Because he has saved us. Do we remember the gospel? That there's nothing we could do. We don't deserve anything but separation from God, and yet he did it all for us, and we're saved. We're called into his family. We're made new forever. We have hope forever. That then should say, okay, God, thank you. What else can I do but say thank you? and live a life that says I'm yours. See, this Christ that we're seeing in Colossians is above all, and he is worthy of all of ourselves, including our thanksgiving. And so let's be about that even today, but as we go into our lives. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we have hope God, I know that there are some in this room who don't have that hope, some watching that don't have that eternal hope, that if they died, they would not, they'd be terrified of it. So Lord, I pray that they would see you are certain, you are sure, and they would give their whole hearts to you, whole lives to you. Turn from sin and self, turn to you as the Savior. But also, God, those who are hopeless right now, feeling the weight, the pressure of life and all the energy that it takes, show them that they can have faith and love today because of that certainty coming. Guaranteed in your resurrection, Jesus, that we have hope today. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to take the Lord's Supper today as one way to remind ourselves of that. Uh, One of my core memories as a kid, I was probably six, in uh, Enid at the Mennonite Brethren Church there, uh, we would do the Lord's Supper every so often, and and one of my core memories is running through the pews after the service and picking up all the cups and making stacks that were like three feet tall. Taking them home, I don't know what to do with them, but washing them and keep, I don't know. But, but I remember this feeling with all the stacks of cups because I had no idea what it was about. It was just cool, just fun. Well, you're going to get a little taste of that because you need to take your trash with you as you go. So you're going to get to stack some cups. Um, but I also want to remind you, and maybe for the first time today, you'll hear what this is about. Why do we do the Lord's Supper? 
Well, Jesus instituted the night before he was crucified. He said to his disciples, guys, this is a way to remember me. And they didn't even know what he was talking about yet because he hadn't died. But he takes the bread and he takes the cup and he breaks the bread and he illustrates with the cup his broken body and shed blood that would pay the penalty for our sin. And he said, guys, when you take these things, remember, there's nothing saving in these. When you take these, remember what I've done for you. That I broke, my body broke for you. My blood shed so you could be forgiven of your sins. There's no other way. And so when we take this, it's a reminder of that, that we can, we can remind ourselves that we need to take Jesus into the very core of who we are and let him change us from the inside out. So maybe today you, you re- remember how far you've drifted from him and from that centrality of Christ in your life. And, and today's, now is the moment for you to deal with that and repent and run back. But all of us are called to remember him and for it to stir our hearts in our thanksgiving for what he's done. I invite the people who are serving the Lord's Supper today to go ahead and come forward and begin to pass that out. If you need gluten-free, it's at the back. Go get that in this moment. There are two cups in every hole as you get the tray and take both cups and hold it until we can partake together in a moment. But we're going to sing a song called In Christ Alone that tells us and reminds us of this gospel again and again and again. And let that stir your heart and see you can lead towards repentance in that as we continue to worship. Christ in us. 
So somebody took mine from over there. So I don't have one. Thank you. It's a well-run machine here. Um, I don't know who got it, but they probably wanted the cups, it seems like, as a little kid. <laughs> Listen, the, the reality of this is <laughs> it's not about how perfect everything works here, right? Like the beauty of this is that this is an imperfect image anyway. And so the fact that it just points us to the perfect one. <clears throat> the beauty of this is that he, he did everything for you. And the shame that you feel, uh, this was not planned by the way, the shame that you feel the sin that you're walking in, this points us to the fact that he did it for you. And let it wash over your soul today. The gospel truth, his life in your place, his death in your place, his resurrection in your place, so you can be forgiven and you can have a hope forever with him. So if you don't know that, please, after we're done, talk to somebody about that you came with or one of us up at the front. But this, Paul reiterated in 1 Corinthians 11, this reality that Jesus said the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember his broken body on the cross for us. here in a moment when we take this drink, let's, we've done this before, just pause. Don't worry about anything else. Don't move. Just rest in this reality because this, what Jesus says about this is, should impact us deeply. This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many, that's including you and me. So do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's remember and pause in that remembrance for a season. Listen, there is a hope that comes because of Jesus that is living. I'm going to sing that song, one of my favorites, Living Hope, where this hope we've been talking about is alive. It is eternal. It is fixed. It is certain. So let this truth stir your heart to not just lift your hands and sing as loud as you can, but to go in his power and to live a life that says, I have hope. If you struggle with that right now, run to him in your heart right now. As we sing this, let this compel you to run to him in this moment as we worship him together.
Amen. Is that not good news, church? <sighs> Our prayer is that you don't walk away with an experience of some sort. Our prayer is that you remember Jesus more as you walk away. If we can pray for you in any way, please come talk to one of us up here. If you're new here, go say hi to somebody out there at the new here section. Meet one of us. We'd love to get to know you and connect you first to Jesus, to our church as well, if we can. Let's pray that God would send us in his power. Lord, thank you. Thank you for hope. I pray you'd fill us more today with that hope. Every one of us would walk away with a renewed vision of the certainty of the resurrection of Christ and the future inheritance we'll have one day together. May that change us. May we love better this week. May we trust more this week and give 
grateful praise in every area of our lives because of who you are and what you've done. Thank you, God. Holy Spirit, we can't do that ourselves, so we need your power. We ask you, help us. In Jesus' authority we pray, amen. Amen. Love you, church, more than you know. You were sent.